Well, good, humid Saturday morning to you. I'm glad you could join us on Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen, your KTAR car guy. Dave Riccio decided to take the morning off today. Maybe he's out uh, running his mountain bike through some of those flooded washes, uh, but certainly I hope not his car. So I decided to bring Tim Nelson from Virginia Auto Service in to help me out a little bit, be my uh, my comfy blanket to rescue me from from silence. Good morning, Matt. <laughs> Good morning. And again, we're here every single Saturday at 11 o'clock right here on 92.3 KTAR to help you with your car. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, that's just what we're here for, is you, the motoring public, helping you have a better car experience, whether it's a prospective purchase, you have a question about whether it's uh, a repair, maybe you're looking for a shop, you can go to bumper to bumper radiocom but we're here to help you with anything car-related, and all you have to do to get involved is give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, Monsoon Safety. We just heard the, the uh, Phoenix Police talking about... Uh, Stupid motorist law, how you could be held responsible for uh, for driving through one of those washes. So whether it's safety with a flooded wash, maybe driving through a dust storm or a haboob, and getting your car ready for the monsoon season and, and taking care of it after the storm. There's There's some before get ready, and then there's some after the fact stuff. And then there's still time for vacations right now. And uh, we don't want to hit the road and have any problems. So, Tim... Thanks for coming in today. I understand you had a little bit of uh, issues after the storm, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, a couple of things. We were doing some cleaning last night, and um, as soon as that we finished cleaning the backyard, that uh, haboob hit. And then on the way into the sh- uh, to the show this morning, on the frontage road uh, off of 17, there was a, quite a bit of debris. So that's one thing you have to be careful for um, after a monsoon is uh, to— those tree limbs or even pool toys you'll see scattered all over the road. So <laughs> um, you just want to be aware of that. Umbrellas, yeah. everything. Anything that anything that's loose that flies ends up a lot a lot of times on the street. So you gotta be aware of that when you're driving after a monsoon. Well one thing I, I was I woke up, I went to bed a little early last night and uh woke up to the storm because we at my house, I'm around thirty second street in Shea, it seems we never get the rain. So it just it was awesome. We went outside, the kids were still awake, I woke up, went out there and just watched the, some of the lightning and, and it was nice because it washed all the dirt down. I mean, I knew it was going to rain, too, because I washed my car yesterday. So that that's a given. So maybe we should all wash our car again today, and then uh, and then we'll get some rain. But the good thing is it washes a, a nice heavy rain like that, washes all the oil and everything off the road. It's worse, and you've got to be really careful when you just have a little bit of rain, because all that does is just bring that that little bit of oil to the top of the road and that's when it makes it slick out there and, and makes the body shops real happy that, that yeah it's almost it's almost like ice when that when that that just a little bit of rain uh, hits the streets after after a long time without it and that oil just makes it a mess out there so yeah it was nice to get a good heavy soaking on this side of town anyway yeah definitely and and so again back to this the safety issue uh, of course like they were saying in the news spotter or you you don't want to be the guy in the news Having the helicopter plucking you out of the out of the wash if you're lucky enough to survive it, and besides the bill that you're going to get from your from the police department or the fire department or city or state or whoever it is that that sends that off to you, you've ruined your car at that point, and you don't even have to go that far to ruin your car. These cars now have really low hood lines, and, and because of that, they need to get everything down. The air intakes are low, where they're you know where the air filter is, where it's sucking the car in. I mean that air filter may be on top, but there's a snorkel that goes down, not up. When you're thinking of snorkel, and and you go through just sometimes just even twelve twelve inches of water is a lot. You go through there. I've seen people suck in water just going thinking they're having fun. Their kids out screwing around in the car, and they go splash through a puddle in the parking lot thinking they're going to douse their friends or make this big deal. <laughs> They just that engine drinks a, takes a big drink of that water, and you cannot compress that. That's that's what they call hydro lock the engine. So you you set yourself up for a big disaster. So that that's the deal with the washes, and just stay out of them. It, it, they're very dangerous. Not to mention the ruin your car. And then the other thing is is driving during the haboob. 
uh, or the dust storm. And ADOT has got some tips on their website, and I'll get those posted on our Facebook page. But you can go to the ADOT website. Uh, I think it's ADOT. I just Googled it. I don't even – I just Googled ADOT dust storm, and, and it's uh, – and there's a list of things to do. So, of course, you want to avoid driving in the dust storm. If you start to get into one, get aware of your surroundings. Are there 18 wheelers next to you? Or you just find out what's around you and then start accommodating your speed to the conditions, slowing down a little bit, maybe looking for a place to go pull over. Maybe it's better just to go get off the highway or, or pull into McDonald's and have a soda or, or Go to a movie. <laughs> yeah, I don't just know. Let, the, let that monsoon pass before you continue driving. Yeah, but if you're and if you're out on, inter, on the interstate, don't wait too long. Don't wait till you can't see to try and figure out what you're doing. Don't ever stop in the travel lane or even they say on the paved side of the road. Don't just pull off to the shoulder. Get off, and that's part of having to do with not waiting too long. Is get off the side of the road so that if someone can't see you and. They don't just run into you. You're out of the traffic. And, again, shut off the lights. Don't sit there with your foot on the brake pedal. Don't turn on the hazards or anything like that. And I think the most, one of the most important things, whether it's a haboob or even you're stuck down here in the 51 rush hour traffic or whatever the case may be, even outside of a storm, if you break down, sit in the car and leave your seatbelt on. Don't get out of the car. That, that's just a whole other chance to get run over. Don't let the kids unbuckle. Get Stay in the car, stay with your seatbelt on, and stay safe. So that's that's some of uh, our tips as well as uh, the majority from, from, from ADOT. Um, another thing is uh, lots of time left for road trips still. And there's an interesting article. Well, I found it interesting anyway on, on KTR.com, on the KTR website this week. It was titled Better Business Bureau. Buyer beware on road trip repairs. And we always hear talk about a relationship with the shop. You want to have a good shop and you want to build a relationship. It's just like your dentist, just like the pediatrician for your kids. You want that consistency. And I read this article, and this was uh, written by one of the reporters here who actually, it was his story. He went out on a road trip, and I see several things wrong with it. He and I'm not picking on you too much, Bob, I hope. <laughs> but he went out on the road. I thought, well, I'm going to get a head start. I'm going to go get my oil change. I'll just get it done in Flagstaff. Big mistake, I think. Agreed. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you don't want to wait till you start your road trip to go then find out that there's something wrong with your car. You're going to a shop that you don't know. In his case, he went to a franchise. Well, Franchises are inconsistent a lot of times. One one franchisee runs it one way, one runs it another way, and and you just don't know what you're getting. It's a mixed bag there. And that's why we promote the, the bumper-to-bumper radio shops because they're consistent. They're typically, or they are mom-and-pop shops. Um, so he goes on the road, gets his oil change, and thinks everything is fine. And, and luckily, they didn't find something wrong. The other problem I see with that is you get there, and you're in Flagstaff getting what you think is just an oil change, and they maybe they find legitimately you have X, Y, and Z wrong. Now what? Now you've already interrupted your road trip. So prepare. Go two or three weeks in advance. You know you're going to go on the road trip. Check it out in advance. Have the car the car looked over. Even the best shops make a mistake. I hate it, Tim. What what do we hate doing this huge job? And then the people go, oh, I, yeah, that would be great. Get everything done because I, I'm leaving tomorrow to uh, you know drive into – Wyoming or something like, oh, yeah, right, yeah, because yeah, you know, you know, you want to always make sure that, like, like Matt said, you know, if you're going to go on a road trip a couple of weeks in advance, that way, if there are things that need to get done, they can get done. You can drive it and make sure there's no other issues. Uh, like I said, the worst thing is that you know you're on the trip a uh, day after a major repair and there is God forsaken something happens. Well, and and forget about that. Maybe there does need repairs, and you decide, you know what, I'll just rent a car. I've gone for a week. You can find deals on rental cars in the summertime in, in Phoenix, and maybe that's that's something that you want to do. Um, but then, unfortunately, on this trip, he had a problem. The shop that he went in for the oil change, they left something loose. The car lost oil. He had to be towed. Stayed overnight. Something happened. All the oil came out. It wasn't a big repair. Luckily, it didn't blow up the engine or anything, so they were able to put oil back in the car. He saved his receipt. He went back to the shop in Flagstaff and said, oh, here's what happened and whatever the discussion was. And, they, and I think they said, okay, we'll give you the 33 bucks back that it cost you to clean up our mess. But maybe the story doesn't end there. That car got run out of oil. 
when is there going to be a problem? Is it two weeks down the road, three weeks down the road, six months? And here you are with this problem and probably little or no recourse. We talked last week with the oil guy on the, the, the tribologist talking about oil samples. Just some intrusion of dirt into that engine can cause extreme wear and, and shorten the life of the engine. So I guess the point is stick with your shop. Go in one or two weeks in advance and ask for that inspection. And then the last thing, an oil change is typically not going to make or break your road trip. So, you know, the oil will be just fine. It's everything else around it typically. So we'll be back and taking your calls at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Matt Allen. Dave Riccio is out enjoying his mountain bike or doing some home maintenance somewhere, I think. And Tim Nelson from Virginia Auto Service is in here helping me. Uh, just like he helps me <laughs> every day, Monday through Friday at the shop. So thanks for coming in, Tim. You're welcome. Well, we've been talking about the monsoon safety and, and how to drive in a dust storm or what to do, what not to do, stay out, of the, stay out of the flooded washes. And we always talk about having a relationship with your shop and having your car checked out before you go on a road trip and having regular maintenance. But i got to tell you, this doesn't mean – come in and run into the shop you don't there's a lot of these things that you can do at home and you don't need to come see us or come spend money that's that's not what we're saying and if it were me and i was going to hit the road and i had to say a newer car let's just say i have a car with forty thousand miles on it chances are that car's in good shape there's nothing wrong with it you don't need to go and have all this super duper inspection of of everything this glorified green service that's ninety dollars and 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 whatever like they market at a lot of places most shops check all these little things with with your oil change but what the easy things to do we don't use our wiper blades very often so i usually find that by the time i need wiper blades they don't work so tim wiper blades you're going to check at home what's your the light, easy stuff your wiper blades your lights and you can take on your wiper blades too i mean you may have not used them for a while so you may want to take a, a damp rag and just wipe them off or you know they may seem to be at first not working right but it just could they could be dirty yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I take the green, uh, not you know, I guess the Brillo pad type deal on the back of the the old sponge or something. Just a couple strokes across the blades, and a lot of times they they work just they, fine. They just work fine. Yeah, you you want to make sure your lights work, and of course you want to make sure that the cars you know the clean, as in the windows are clean. Because if we just had a like for example, we had the haboob last night. The wind the windows on my car this morning are just nasty, dirty, and then you have to make sure that you can see. You know. See, my car was parked outside, luckily, so it got a, a full wash job, actually, <laughs> courtesy of Mother Nature. It, it actually rinsed all the all the dirt off. But that's a good point. That's the thing. I, I hate going on a road trip with a dirty car. So go get a car wash. That's one. And then, again, check the lights. And we're talking the headlights, the taillights, the turn signals. Make sure the flashers work, the license plate light bulbs. And that's all stuff that's very easy to do. And most shops are doing that with it with the oil service. Now, if you've got an older car, go in and get the inspection. Ask them. You want them to to look this car over. A lot of shops are looking for repairs. That's what we're in the business to do is look for repairs. But some shops just find stuff that they like to do. Uh, you know, oh, you need a tranny flush. Oh, you need a this. You need a that. That stuff is not making or breaking your trip. So your shop, you want them to check the tires, check the suspension, if there's a sign on the tires that there might be an issue. Looking at the belts and hoses. Of course, you want to keep your maintenance maintenance current. And, of course, we, we don't have a crystal ball. I wish wish we would. But I've seen a handful of repairs this week in our shop that were major repairs that could have been avoided with a little bit of maintenance. So if you've got a question or anything you want to talk about on your car, please give us a call, 602-277-5827, and we'll get you on. Don't be shy. And uh, we've got some... Very patient Fred from Mesa Holding with the 1999 BMW. What can I help you with, Fred? Hey, man. Hey, Tim. Good morning. Finally got, morning. Finally got rid of Dave, I see. Yeah, we let him have a day off. I'm, I'll be gone next week, so uh, he decided to play a little hooky today. Well, wonderful. I've got a 99 BMW uh, 528. My ABS and traction control keep coming on intermittently. No, just driving down the road, it'll come on. And I know that has something to do with some internal diagnostic, but I'm trying to determine if it's something that I can do myself, change a sensor or something, or well, do, I need to go, do I need to go do the full service? Well, you probably, I don't know what your mechanical skills are, but 
the BMWs, most any car, they, they're going to have a wheel speed sensor, and it might be the right front. I think it's on the BMW. It's the left front that they use for the the speedometer. So one thing is if your speedometer was cutting out, that may be an indication that you have just that one speed sensor going bad. But what's happening, the analog brake control computer is looking at, at it relies on the speed of each individual wheel to understand if there's lockup. And that's how the it's going to control the function of the ABS. So if it loses one of those sensors, that the, the, just picture the computer freaking out going, hey, hey, wh wh where's the right front? It's going 400 miles an hour or it, it's completely stopped, but yet we still have throttle input. We don't have any brake input and the other three wheels are working. It can't, that doesn't compute with, that, with, the, with the system. It can't work. So it's going to throw up the flag, turn on the orange light, and say, I can't help you. I'm not working right now because I'm not getting good information. Some of those older systems will store a code in the computer, or we just go in with an interface, and we actually, actually watch each wheel speed, drive the car, or have it up on the lift, and spin the wheel. And look, that's the first place I would be starting in the shop. You could go through, we can go through with a voltmeter and check the voltage, or we're checking the AC voltage and see if that is a, if, it, if the sensor, some of those produce a voltage, they're a signal generator, or they're a Hall effect switch where they're just showing on and off, so it's a square wave, and depending on the frequency of that square wave, tells the computer how, how fast the car is going. Probably something best left for a shop, depending on what your, what your mechanical skills are. So thanks for the call, Fred. We're going to go in Juan with Juan in Phoenix on a 2012 Nissan Titan. What can we do for you, Juan? Yeah, this may be the most important call of my life. Uh, I'm a pool guy, so my truck's very important to me, and I got a lot of toys to, to haul and stuff. And uh, last July, I bought a brand-new 2012 Nissan Titan. And uh, it's still in August. I was at, in the bank line, you know, in the drive through teller, and I looked down at my temperature gauge, and it was getting into the uh, past the warning to the H. And so I immediately uh, started driving, and it immediately went down, and it never overheats unless I'm sitting in one spot with the air conditioner on. And um, I was wondering, um, I brought it in the Nissan for them to look at, and they just they got it to happen, and they just all they did was put a new instrument panel in because they thought the instrument panel was getting wrong readings and that it wasn't actually overheating. And I'm still overheating. I can't sit down. I can't sit in my truck and have lunch during a hot day with the air conditioner on without the uh, temperature gauge going up to high. And uh, I was wondering what questions and how I go about to find this what seems to be a hard-to-diagnose problem. Um, I'm wondering also, when I bought this truck, it sat in the lot, um, so the battery was no good. So for, for the first 30 days of the truck, I was uh, driving with a bad battery, didn't know it until a couple times I had to get a jump start, and they had to put a new battery in. So I don't know if that might have messed up a water pump, an electric fan. Well, probably not. I mean, the, the battery may have been weak. But let me ask you this. When you're sitting there having lunch or trying to have lunch in the, in the car, the temperature gauge is going up. Does the air conditioner stop blowing cold? Yes, it does. Okay. Well, that is, is a sign that there's a problem with the, what I would think would be the electronic cooling fan. There's a difference. If we could have the gauge saying the car is overheating and the car actually overheating itself. So there's let them know that you're having that problem because without the airflow coming over the condenser from the electric fan, you're going to have the air conditioning not work well and the car is going to start to creep up. You start driving down the road, you get more airflow, the air conditioning gets cold, and the car cools down. So that's a great question, but take notes, take that back to your dealer, and, and have them check it. And we'll be right back with more car questions and more car answers. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen. This guy helping me out is Tim Nelson from Virginia Auto Service, and we are here to help you with your car every single Saturday at 11, from 11 to noon on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Dave Riccio took the weekend off. He's out uh, cruising around on his mountain bike probably. And so we're here to help you. And it, we get a lot of emails at bumper to bumper radio.com. Some are questions. Some are complaints. You know, they don't 
like the way I look or the way Dave sounds or who knows. Peter's in there shaking his head, looking at me and telling me I'm ugly. <laughs> Depending on the time of day, who knows. But it's really satisfying a lot of the positive emails that we get. And I want to uh, read one. I'll try and, I didn't realize it was this long until I looked at it again. But I just want to quickly summarize. And the guy writes, Hi, my name is Ray. My wife and I live in Sun City in a retirement community. Uh, I want to have to, to express my appreciation for your helping me find a great shop listening to our favorite radio station, KTAR 92.3. I just happened to be listening on a Saturday morning for the first time. I heard Bumper to Bumper with Matt and Dave. After I got home, I went to the computer and did my research. And Well, now I know all I need to know about Matt and Dave. I checked your preferred lo- shop list and uh, was looking for somebody that had high ethical standards and their main concern was make sure they take care of their customers, which all the bumper-to-bumper shops do. Reviewing the list, I selected Dave's Car Care at 51st Avenue in Peoria. He's the closest to my home, but not all that close. It's still quite a drive. I live 20 miles from the repair shop and and went over there. They were able to – now I'm really getting out of track here and summarizing. A few days later, I went and saw Dave Denman, the owner. He had our car service, and let me tell you, their office, their shop, the whole place was exceptional, clean. It's just a great place. It's like locking into a hospital. It was very impressive. The moral of the story is here, without me going and reading this multi-paragraph email, is the shops at Bumper to Bumper Radio – are here to take care of you and give you a good experience, take care of your car, be open and honest with you, and help walk you through repairs. So thanks for sending in that letter, and thanks to Dave Demon at Dave's Car Care for putting on the good face and showing how the bumper-to-bumper shops are. I think that that experience could be duplicated all over. And the other thing that that email tells me, the relationship in the shop. This guy will drive 20 miles to get his car serviced. There's a whole lot of places in Sun City that could probably fix a car. And he's been to a handful of them and was not happy. And Dave's took care of him. So find that relationship and stick with them. And we appreciate your emails. If you have something, a show topic you like to hear about or something you want to tell us, you can go to bumper to bumperradio.com. So we're going to go with Richard in Tucson. And Richard has wants to tell us about an auto repair nightmare. However, Richard, just one rule. You don't get to say names of shops that did something bad. Even though you're in Tucson, we still don't want to be beating people up. So what can we help you with, or what can you tell us? Well, I have, my wife and I have a 2006 Kia Sedona van. We bought it brand new, and now we have 130,000 miles on it. We've had a few little problems here and there, but in the, I keep the van running just great. I've never changed the spark plugs because Kia, I went into Kia um, to the service center and asked them, I heard a rumor that the vehicle had 100,000 miles spark plugs. And they said, yes, that's true. And I said, well, look, we've got 125, 100, almost 126,000 miles on this van. It still runs great. When do we need to change the spark plugs? And Kia didn't have a hard, fast answer for that. Awesome. To this, we just got back from a trip up in Utah, and this van runs great, gives exceptional mileage. I keep clean oil in it. I I I keep this thing running great. But when do I change the spark plug? Do I wait till it starts to miss? And no, abs- absolutely not. I I bet if you go, I think you should go refer to your owner's manual. And and I don't know off the top of my head on that car, Tim. What's your first guess? When are the spark plugs do? 60,000. You think 60 on that yeah, one? Yeah, but I was going to say 105, but I've seen, you know, some of them the first time around at at, at 120. So it yeah, just it, it it changes so often now on making model of cars. It could be 120. Yeah, and there's been a shift. A lot of the, you know, GM I think was one of the first ones. They were going out to this 100,000 mile spark plug. But you see Audis and Volkswagens are at 40,000. Some cars, I saw one the other day. I couldn't find spark plugs in the maintenance schedule anywhere. And finally, till I got to 120,000 miles was the first time that they're ca- calling for spark plugs. You're, you're pro- it could be 60. It could be 105. 
Uh, where do the Suburbans uh, and stuff do? They're 100, they're right, 100, Tim? yeah. They're 100,000 yeah. miles? Some of the Chryslers are at 75,000. Yeah, they're starting to be at odd numbers. And these spark plugs, we've seen where they've gone to these iridium and platinum. I mean, the buzzword was platinum a while ago. You don't really hear people marketing iridium spark plugs. They're expensive. You can have a $30 spark plug, but you're not replacing those every 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 60 or 30,000 miles. But I'm starting to see some of the newer ones. We had a late model Jeep in the other day. The spark plugs were not the super expensive spark plugs, and they were called for every 30,000 miles, which was you know, traditionally what we would say. You know, Your Honda or Acura or Nissan, they would typically be every 30,000. So I would have a hard look at the owner's manual. But I wouldn't wait to you have a problem to no. replace them. Well, Definitely. what what's, what, what's going to happen when you wait? You're going to have a misfire. Then you're going to have diagnosis because you don't know if you're if you if it's the spark plug that's bad or or maybe you're going to overwork the coil and you're going to ruin the ignition coil. Uh, if you have a misfire, that means you're delivering unburned fuel into the into the engine or through the exhaust system, so the car is going to be less efficient. You're going to get poor gas mileage. You're going to ruin the catalytic converter. Yeah, that's and the, that's very expensive. Yeah. So, and, and then you're if if you were to wait till a misfire, you're going to see a flashing check engine light. That's bad news. So, uh, Richard, I would just I would go to the owner's manual. Start there. If you can't find something, let me know. You can send me a, a, a email. Go to the contact page on bumper to bumper radio dot com, and I'll help you find the specification. Uh, and and uh, those should be replaced. And then you want to consider when you're doing that servicing the fuel injection system. Maybe there's some that car might have three spark plug wires, depending on how the ignition system is set up with the with the direct coils and boots and such. So ask the shop when they're replacing the spark plugs. Is there anything else we should do with this? Sounds like you're going to keep the car for a while. So great question. We appreciate you calling in, and we're going to go with Hector in Peoria on a 19 or 2005 Nissan Sentra. Hector, what can we do for you? Good morning, uh, Matt and Tim. How are you doing? Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I have a 2005 Nissan Sentra, and I have to put oil in it like every two to three weeks. And I'm not talking a little bit of oil. I'm talking two to three quarts of oil. Uh, a lot of my friends tell me it's the valve, the bad valve. Do you have any suggestions as to what's causing that? Um, well, I guess the first thing I would ask you, is there oil leaking underneath the car? No, there's no oil. I see no puddles in my garage. It's, 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 there's no leaks. I even checked the uh, radiator water. The water's green, so they tell me there's no cracks in the engine. My friends do. I, I haven't consulted a mechanic, but I thought I'd call you guys and find out. How many it. miles are on this? 165,000 miles. Okay. Well, I would still take a look. Under, that's a lot of oil. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's quite a bit of oil. Yeah, like that's two, a three lot weeks. of oil. That's like and see, I, I, my my um, daughter took it to college, and since she's been back, I've just have been having problems with it. So well, we need to. I've got three daughters. I think we probably need to start preparing them for a car maintenance when they when they go off to school. Um, Absent leaks on the ground, we would have to assume that the the engine is consuming the oil. I would still have a look underneath the car because we see cars in the shop, Tim. We tell people they have an oil leak, and they tell us we're crazy until they either go home and look at the spot on the ground where they were parking because they never see it because when they're home, the car is always on top of it. Or you but might, there's so many covers under these cars these days. Yeah, in the center, I don't think there's a lot of shields yeah. or anything covering. But what I was going to say is the the oil blows backwards. We'll find that the you know they have an oil leak from the left rear. That's what they tell us. And what that is, that's all the engine oil that was blowing backwards. And now it's finally dripping off the lowest point of the rear strut or something. So it sounds like you know what you're doing as far as looking at that. I take another look, but that that's a lot of oil. Um, I'd be surprised that you don't have smoke from the engine with that kind of consumption and i would be surprised that maybe you don't have a check engine light with a catalyst failure because if you're pumping that kind of motor oil through the engine you're going to ruin the catalytic converter and that in itself will turn on a light for it's not a light telling you have an oil leak it's a light telling you that there's a catalyst efficiency issue best thing to do you just heard us talking about dave's car care at 51st avenue in peoria go in there spend a few bucks have them have them look the car over and come up with a solution for you and again, anybody looking for a shop, bumper to bumper radio dot com. So thanks for the call. Steve from Phoenix on a Jeep Wrangler. What can we help you with? Oh <clears throat> good to hear from you. The um, I have a two thousand seven Jeep Wrangler, the X model, so it's not the uh, Rubicon. 
I, got, I bought it used, got about 90,000 miles on it. One of the big things is it's got a light on the dashboard. It's, I think or it's actually not on the dashboard. It's down towards the center console. It says SRS something. Uh, I'm not in the vehicle right now, so I couldn't tell you. It has to do, I guess it's that traction control system that I, um, that's not working. It, it kind of simulates like a uh, posit track. I took it to the dealership. Um, they just cleared the code out. And within a half mile of the sh- of the dealership, it came back on again. Okay. Well, um, SRS is Secondary Restraint System, or TRAC stands for Traction Control. Okay. Um, secondary it, Restraint. Two, which, would, it, it, which would be an airbag issue, potentially. Or, or a seatbelt issue. Could be a seatbelt issue on SRS, but typically an SRS problem or an airbag system or seatbelt issue isn't going to cause the ABS light to come on or the traction control light. So if you have a traction control light, much like the guy that called earlier with the BMW, the computer is relying on wheel speed to control the traction, you know, the control of the vehicle. So if it can't see wheel speed, or maybe you're seeing like a dynamic stability control light too, that could be what that is. But if if you start to slip one wheel on ice, the engine control computer will recognize that and cut back power so that you don't get wheel spin and, and get out of control. It could also be in a braking situation where the car will want to take control if it has dynamic stability control and help you recover from a slide. And, and those systems rely on wheel speed to help keep – to make that – that system work. If it went on a half mile down the road, I bet we have a problem with a wheel speed sensor or something like that. The good thing is it doesn't seem to be intermittent. It's duplicatable. Where if you if they cleared it, it came right back on again. So you just need to get to a shop that's got the right equipment that can test test that. Whether it's the dealer, I know my shop. We spent a lot of money this year going with all factory scan tools. We have the original Clement Chrysler, original you know, which is all the Dodge, that whole family, uh, Honda Acura, Toyota, and get in there and take a look, and, and it shouldn't be that big of a deal to figure it out. It just depends on what the fix is. It could be a, a cheap spend sensor, or it could be an expensive computer. But it's just a matter of getting somebody to look at it, and uh, it shouldn't be a big deal to fix. So we've got some open lines at 602 277 5827 602 277 KTAR. If you want to get involved, just give us a call and we'll do everything we can do to help you with your question. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper, and we're just talking about cars today. Anything you want to talk about during this show, all you've got to do is give us a call. Um, we're here every Saturday from 11 to, 11 to noon helping you. We're here to help you with your car. So it's a car question, maybe you want to buy a car. You, you have a question about a repair, you don't know what to do, just just let us know and we'll help you. And Tim, one of the things that I, I mentioned earlier in the show today was the amount of repairs that we saw in our shop this week that could have been avoided. Your car is talking to you when these lights are on. These manufacturers spend millions of dollars developing these systems and processes and programs and, and algorithms, if you will, in these cars. I don't know how many times we hear shops say, just ignore the light, just, oh, you don't need to fix it, cover it with tape, <laughs> you know, put a put a post-it note over your dash or something. That That's bad news. That when, when Again, this car is begging you for help when these lights are on. Yeah, it's a warning light, it, so you want to you want to address it. Yeah, in noises. We had a, a car this week that it, was, it could have been just a very simple overheating problem. The guy heard a pop noise. Well, that pop was the radiator blowing up. But then he continued to drive it. Well, he didn't see the gauge going off, you know, no warnings because all the water came out. There's nothing there to heat that, that sending unit up and send that, you know, turn the light on. That car got ruined. Um, just got to pay attention. Be aware of the noises. Get to know your car, so to speak. Just listen. It's telling you something when it's rattling and making noises. And it's not just, oh, the car's old. There's no reason for an old car to be making a bunch of noises. So... So just just keep that in mind, and uh, and and you'll keep you'll be happy with your car. You'll get good life out of your car, and your car will take care of you if if you take care of it. So we're gonna go with Monica in Chandler. She's got a 2004 Toyota Highlander. Monica, what can we help you with today? Hi. Yeah, um, I just recently bought this vehicle at a used car dealership, and I just whenever I start the vehicle, um, the maintenance required light flashes. 
like five, six times, and then it stops. And it always flashes right when I start the vehicle. Um, and I just uh, looked into my manual, and the maintenance required light says that it needs an oil replacement. And I just changed the oil about 200 miles ago. Is there something else that I can't seem to find in my manual? No, probably not. In, in the, the As smart as these cars can be today, the car doesn't know you changed the oil. So wow. probably what happened is the shop that you used just didn't reset the light, and that happens occasionally. If the light's not on, maybe when you got the oil service done, five hundred okay, yeah. then five hundred miles later it comes on. The car doesn't know any better. It only knows it, it, it's either monitoring mileage or it's monitoring the driving conditions since that light was last reset, and it will turn the light on when it thinks it's appropriate. So all you need to do is reset it, take it back to the shop, and ask them to do that for you. Okay. Sometimes you can do that yourself. You know, there's a goofy thing. You've got to turn the key on, pump the gas slowly five times, and, and it might tell you how to do that in your in your owner's manual. You could Google okay. it. You might find a video about it or just pop in the shop and ask them to do it for you. And, that, and that's, okay. t- that's typically all that light is. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for calling. Thanks. And, yeah, that's that. unfortunately not too uncommon is, is if you're out of sequence with the light – it, w- it could just come on midway through an oil change cycle like she had just 200 miles later. So just re- sometimes we just got to remind the shop. We do it too. You just, you just got to reset the light. But also I never recommend waiting for that light for the oil change. I think in my opinion those go way too far at times. So just keep an eye on the oil. Just keep everything checked and, and you should be good. So we're going to go with Jeff on a Mitsubishi Lancer. Jeff, what can we help you with? Hi, guys. How's it going? Going well today. Thank you. Good morning. Good, good. Uh, I'm thinking about getting an 06 Lancer uh, SE, and uh, it's got a leaky valve cover gasket and also needs CV boots done on it. I'm just wondering, number one, where would you take that? And number two, can you give me a rough estimate on what that might be? Um, well, is that is that a V6 or a four-cylinder engine? It's, it's a four-cylinder. Okay. And what part of town do you live in? Uh, Awatuki. Awatuki. Well, first off, I, on, on the valve cover gasket, it's not that big of a deal to do. I, I, I'm, done, I'm not going to get into the pricing game. It's a lot of customers call and ask for prices over the phone. I don't know the totality of everything. The mileage, maybe the PCV hose is hard and brittle and we should replace that. Is the valve cover gasket replacing it or leaking enough to where we need to pressure wash the engine, clean it up? Um, but as far as the shop... I would go in Awatuki ADS. You're going to find it's Automotive Diagnostic Specialties. Go to bumper to bumper There's a map. There's all the information about Greg's shop there. They're on Tim. Where are they? You know it's exactly. Chandler Boulevard in like 54th yeah, Street. And I would and I would also if you haven't purchased the car yet, maybe call them and have the car inspected, uh, pre-purchase inspection before you make that purchase. I don't know who told you that. The valve cover gaskets and the CV boots need to be replaced if it was the the owner or not. But I would have that car inspected first if you can, so that way you could find if there's any other issues with the car. Yeah, that, that's a good point. didn't even think about that, and it's not been as hot of a topic lately with used cars not being as, as hard to come by as they were several months ago. It's always worth the 50 or $100 investment to go have a car checked out before you you jump off and make that purchase. There's a lot of good cars out there that are for sale, but there's a lot of cars out there that are something that somebody's selling because they didn't want to fix the problems themselves. You know, they're just moving on to to the next one. So, thanks for the call. And we're going to go with Ray in Gold Canyon on a 2004 Mustang. Ray, what can we do for you? Hi, uh, guys. How are you doing today? Great. What can we good. do for you? Uh, got a '94 Mustang that. Uh, uh, I, I don't drive it very much. It's only got 50-some-odd thousand miles on it, Mustang convertible. And uh, it's a super nice little car, but it would draw the battery down if I let it sit for a few days. So I decided I'd try to track down what was, uh, you know, pulling the battery down. And I put a test light across the uh, cable from the ground cable to the post on the battery and then started pulling fuses and I have isolated it to a a box in the trunk under the tucked in behind the left rear fender that is part of a keyless entry slash anti theft device. And that thing appears to be 
ha- have something wrong inside of it. It's a module. It's got three printed circuit boards inside of it, and you can't buy the, either the module or any of the parts anymore. So what I'm wondering is, um, if is there a way to d- disable that thing without disabling the whole car? Or even, and that's probably a question that you all probably can't answer, but maybe you know somebody that's in the auto alarm business or auto electronics that could uh, uh, advise me on that. And you did the old school method of checking for a draw by putting that test light there. So I'm assuming the light was uh, on until you pulled the fuse, right? Yeah, here's the way it went. I pulled the high current fuse under the hood, and the one that dropped out the light was the one that's the headlight circuit. So I put that back in, went under the dashboard, and started doing the same thing with the low current fuses. And when I got to a little 10 amp fuse that says uh, anti theft uh, gauge cluster. Uh, right. And ignition well, Ray, line. that might be the circuit that it's on, but yeah, I'd be tough at going in and, and just starting to replace that module. There's a, some shops on bumper to bumper radio.com and maybe some of the ones in the East Mesa area closer to where you are in Gold Canyon. 